at my wedding, uh, a, a rather Hollywood person uh, said she must sing, and she would have been an opera singer. No one had ever heard of her, but she insisted that she sing. And she <laughs> arrived, and she had her face pulled up so tight. And I don't know if she had it clipped up or what, but and then she had this huge wig over however she pinned up her face. And you know, if, I remember that more than I remember anything about my wedding. <laughs> so what, what it, at the time, I was so young, and I, I just thought, it's really hard to get old in Los Angeles. But, uh, so now, here are the experts. And Linda is going to tell you how this came about. Hi, I'm Linda Gravenson. I'm the editor of this book. I'm going to speak as loud as I can, and if you can't hear, wave your arms in the back. Stand up. I no, can't see you. Well, oh. Yeah. Okay. We'll On the bench. We'll try it this way. Um, what, I'm going to give you a little menu. Um, I'm going to read very briefly from the intro, which I've written, so you have a sense of how this book happened and what it's about. I'm also going to read briefly from my contribution, and then I will turn it to poet Joan Nicholson, Gretchen Haig, Abigail Thomas, and when they've read from their pieces, we're going to have a really lively discussion, because that's what happens at these readings. Not to put any pressure on you. <laughs> That's what happens. Okie doke, here we go. When this collaboration began around a coffee table in the Hudson Valley, I was drawn to it from a somewhat different perspective than Emily's. I had grown up in the 1940s and 50s, before the maps of tradition were shredded and had come through some of the losses she was anticipating, but also knew of the rewards that can follow in their wake. I'd moved to the country alone with four animals as family, lived without my city neighbors for the first time, learned to drive at 53, and most important, resumed writing and editing. I've always loved the richness of anthologies, particularly essay collections created to explore a complex, even mysterious landscape. We decided to seek out writers and performers willing to go wherever our theme took them, the choices were theirs. Some of the most accomplished, prize-winning writers in America, Canada, and Great Britain responded. Many of them admitted that the assignment was more challenging than they'd imagined it would be. They reported on both the fear and the exhilaration of going deep enough to tell the truth. Their bravery is palpable. Some have made discoveries that may lead to new work, even a few new books. Two playwrights, a biographer, poets, novelists, memoirists, essayists, <coughs> a physician, a musician, and two actresses are among the 32 women who have created this book. They have addressed the unexpected pleasures of living alone, new places as new chapters in life, giving cancer the slip, and boldness later in life. The love of having role models, the solace of literature in a foreign hospital, reliance on faith, <coughs> both acceptance and despair at being older, raging at the death of friends, new relationships with dead parents, swimming the Bosphorus one last time and other urgent yearnings yet to be fulfilled, an adult child's addiction, the painful disappointment of adopting a damaged child in later life, and more. Our later years often bear a striking resemblance to adolescence. We are simultaneously tremulous, opinionated, bold, surprisingly shy, and nonchalant or self-conscious about our appearance, to name just a few of the possible contradictions. What is not adolescent is our capacity for self-irony, which seems to increase in later life. Finally, we're able to step back, breathe in and out, and poke some fun at ourselves. 
Our contributors speak to the events, the inevitabilities that confront us all in a world bearing less resemblance to anything we've ever known. Here then are their daring pieces, engaging interplays of darkness and light, offering what is often the most comfort, the company of others. These are the women I'd want in my lifeboat. <laughs> okay, a few excerpts from my piece, which is called My Mother and Me and Betty Brable. <laughs> <coughs> Mashed potatoes. My mother sits straight up in bed in the intensive care unit in New York Hospital on yet another of her emergency admissions for heart disease. Her head is wrapped in a printed scarf. Her lipstick is a fuchsia slash. Her eyes are as wild and roving as all the other times she's been in this manic state. I'm dying here. They bring me mashed potatoes. <laughs> she stabs at the air with her index finger and gestures for me to take my seat. She is in the middle of her aria. How this mad hatter in a Carmen Miranda turban can be holding court in the intensive care unit speaks for her sheer force. She's got the staff jumping. Nurses adjust her tubes, <coughs> shaking their heads in disbelief, muttering objections to being ordered around. Diabetes and heart disease have joined with manic depression to complete the circle of illness that has held her hostage from my earliest memories. None of the doctors can figure out what keeps her alive. As her caretaker for 30 years, I know her better and know she still has the will to jump into action, if only with her voice, which rasps and growls as words are swallowed and spit out again. The antipsychotic drug Thorazine has destroyed her once lovely singing voice. <coughs> her thoughts leap, dipping and diving as the familiar manic soliloquy takes over. Middle of the movie, mad money, that salesman your father, Teddy's daughter. She sneers at the thought of my father and goes on to me. You, you Sarah Lawrence girl, you. The doorman, the doorman, sailing on the Liberté, those twerps, wrapped in wildflowers, I was. <clears throat> Settled back against the pillows, she glares at me. They gave me the wrong baby, she bellows. <laughs> Her eyes narrowing, aiming for the bull's eye, instinctively knowing what will hurt me the most. But probably not knowing, she's identified the pain of our long entangled story of my attachment and revulsion, my obstinate wish for reunion that keeps me in her thrall. In the late 1950s, when I was 18, her life was a full-blown emergency, with midnight ambulance rides to psychiatric wards, with shock treatments rudely, crudely given, and medication management years away. Because my father asked for my help, I went on those rides with him. When he left, I became her unofficial guardian at 22 and went on those rides alone. <coughs> Not until I was way past the agoraphobia that hit me in my 30s could I link the condition to those dramas with my mother, to the sanatoriums I dutifully visited, unable to admit to the terror and guilt they provoked of being like her or the survivor guilt of being not like her. Have to wiggle. <laughs> Whenever I was tempted to walk away as my father had, I was drawn back by the binding question, what was illness, what was my mother? Not all manic depressives are as mean as my mother could be, just as not all alcoholics are mean drunks. For 50 years, I've been haunted by the debate. I'm told that in the psychiatric community, the vote is still out on illness and character. Now that she was dead, my mother was manageable. Without her endless drama in the raw stillness of an upstate winter, I could go back. When we walk home from school with my mother's arms filled with packages and my jaws aching from the double bubble gum I've been given as a treat and a lure for the artistic detour she wanted to make into the Whitney Museum, 